The Commentary Booth is a show for media lovers by media lovers just like you. If you want to support the show, go to pariomagazine.com.au. Welcome to the Commentary Booth, the ultimate weekly entertainment recap and review show. My name is Jamie Apps, and each week I'll be joined by a rotating cast of co-hosts to run you through the entertainment media we've consumed during the week. Along the way, we'll provide you with insightful commentary and reviews. This week I'm joined by a teacher and travel blogger who lists their favourite movie as Fight Club and favourite TV show as Band of Brothers. Welcome back to the show, Buddy McClellan. Thank you for having me back again. How's life been? Nice on school holidays again. Enjoying school holidays, just home from the golf course. Um, lots of wedding prep because we've got one month now, so the countdown begins. I'm sure the countdown began months ago for Anne, though. Oh, I think everyone, my mum's the worst. She's got, like, the app on her phone that, like, has it to the minute. So I'm getting, like, updates from her every day of different screenshots of her app. So, yeah, <laughs> I think the countdown has begun for a few people. They've been waiting 10 years. Yeah, that's true. I uh, had to go and get a new suit specifically for it. Hey, sharp man. Yeah, well, I uh, wore my suit to Hamilton, not last week, the week before. A little snug, a little bit snug. <laughs> Too many Big Macs, mate. Yeah, I think nearly 10 kilos will do that to you. Hey, <laughs> so you'll be looking sharp. Uh, what else have you been up to? Have you been watching much? Um, watching a lot of documentaries and sports documentaries again, which has been fun. So, yeah, back to my old favourites, I guess. Yeah, I saw one of those looks pretty interesting, the uh, Luna Park one. What's that about? Yeah, so I actually got onto this one from watching uh, Gogglebox. And you know how they kind of just watch little snippets of things? Okay, yep. And that kind of hooked me enough to, to go back and watch it. So it's on ABC iView. It's called uh, Exposed the ghost train fire at Luna Park. And basically it follows a ABC reporter who uh, tries to expose things. So they had a previous season, which I haven't watched. It's pretty much just a a true crime sort of um, mini documentary series. So this is series two, um, and it follows the investigation into a ghost train fire, which I don't know if you heard that happened back in, I think it was 1979 in June. So uh, the ghost train at Luna Park caught on fire and burnt seven people to death inside of it mm-hmm. yeah um we had an article come into the newspaper this week about it and i was like oh that sounds like an interesting doco and then a day later you're like oh yeah i've been watching this and i was like oh whoa yeah super interesting because it's not just kind of following what happened so the, the episodes there's three episodes and they kind of break down into uh, kind of explaining what happened and looking into the victims which is some pretty sad stories they lost four 13-year-old boys who are all schoolmates, uh, and they interview, there was a fifth boy, so they had, basically, you can have two, like, you know, on the ghost train, you can have two people per car, Yep. so five of them went, so two in the first car, two in the second, and then a fifth kid, so the two went in, and they burnt to death, the next two went in, they burnt to death, and this fifth kid was about to go in, and they realised the fire was happening, and they stopped him just as the doors were opening for his car, so he's obviously quite distraught and damaged still, he's an adult now, obviously, but, yeah, he... He kind of tells his story and the, I wouldn't say worse, but just as bad was the other people that died. There was two young, like three and four year old boys, or maybe five year old boys uh, with their dad that were on a holiday from the country. And they, um, they were supposed to go in with their mum, but she decided at the time for whatever reason to go and get them ice cream, turned around and basically didn't see them come back out. And they burnt to death in there as well while she was just standing there with an ice cream in her hand, completely in shock. And she lost her entire family. Whoa. Yeah. And, and it follows some other people. It interviews people that were witnesses and things like that, that um that noticed fire happening on the ghost train and said how crazy it was. And the, the attendant that was working on there who ran in and to his credit got some people out. But as you can imagine, it was pretty flammable back in its day. And once it filled up with smoke, like if you've been on a ghost train, once you're in the dark, And it's all kind of a maze to itself, you know, it kind of zigzags and goes backwards and forwards and you just get completely lost in there. So once it was filled with smoke and people had no idea where to go, it was yeah, pretty much a death trap for them. So it kind of looks into the the who died and the the impact, um, which is obviously pretty devastating for all of those families. And then it kind of looks at, at, at the time, the police pretty much immediately cleared the crime scene and came back with a decision that it was an electrical fault that had caused the fire that a fuse box had blown up but they go through these records that um and a 
guy that used to work there had that was like a big fan of the park and just thought there was something fishy about it and he collected this massive information and it kind of took 30 odd years for these journalists to get their hands on it and be able to sift through it all um, and which it kind of coincided at a similar time to where a lot of the legal stuff that happened got released it had a 30 year bar on it so after that's all been released a lot more information has come to light about it and it really follows these journalists in the next sort of two episodes going through and, and working out that they blamed an electrical box for setting the fire. But when you look at the photos, the one thing that didn't catch on fire was the electrical box. <laughs> they like they say that if the if the electrical fire had happened, the last thing, even when the fire was on and you can see photos of it, the lights were still on. So it couldn't have been electricity. All these people smelt kerosene and they were ignored and the police pushed people to change their testimonies and all sorts of crazy stuff that without giving away the whole story, it's it's really interesting and really scary that you start to see that people who are in positions of power can't always be trusted like you would wish you could trust them when it comes to sort of police and politicians and things like that it actually goes quite high. So a really interesting watch and just really sad to see how expendable some people's lives can be for the, the interests of others that are in more powerful positions. Yep, and you said it was, what, three episodes, three hour ish episodes three hour and a half or three i think it's they're roughly hour and a half hour 20 minute episodes okay so it's a nice solid watch it's not quickly over with no it goes deep and it like it i think it needs to i mean like she uncovers a lot of information that the families themselves didn't know and you really feel that empathy for the families it gives you enough time to i mean you're obviously always going to feel empathy for somebody that's lost their child or i mean particularly the lady that i said that had the ice cream when they interview her she you can just tell like it's it's absolutely devastated her entire life yep. and you really want her to find justice and want her to get the answers she deserves and it gives you enough time to I guess meet the people and really get into it and it even though it was the hour and a half episodes uh, Anne and I found ourselves sort of we, episode one we finished late at night but then the second one we couldn't wait to go back and watch and then we watched two in a row straight up so I mean we power watched three hours of it because it hooked us so bad okay um and yeah like like you said the ghost trains they are like you wouldn't even think it was like oh okay it's smoky you wouldn't think anything anything of it until it got too crazy yeah i mean the fire when they report like the witnesses that saw it they said that the fire started in the fake fire so they had like a fake you know and they have the little fan underneath the lights and the little wavy bits of material yep yeah so they said it actually was starting around there and the fire grew from there so they kind of went in and out without really thinking too much about it but then by the time the next people had gone in yeah big inferno that they couldn't escape yeah and like you think of some of those rides that were at Luna Park at the time they were just big wooden contraptions like they would have gone up so quick yeah and it's weird to think even now that Luna Park like it, it operates and still I just built something or stuck something over the top of where these seven people died and it kind of still is operating at the moment like it's I like that it's there but also it feels like it's been really swept under the rug in terms of what happened with the police and the the justice for the families but also for public image like it's a very public place for sydney to have a really sad story yeah like it's crazy that they're still open you would think like if that happened today at wonderland or jamboree or but i suppose when you look at uh yeah dream world <laughs> that's still open i guess yeah it's just you feel for those like the same thing with the dream world people you go to those places thinking you're gonna have a good time and come home and yeah without safety measures but uh, this one it, in, in the end it seems that it's more intentionally done yep. and when it comes down to it and you think about it they talk about the idea was to get the the real estate and there's no more prime piece of real estate than where Luna Park sits like it's got the views of the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge just sitting there in North Sydney yeah yeah it's in a incredible spot to have a theme park uh, and yeah on that note of sort of crime and cover-ups I've been watching a show on Disney Plus on the new star offerings it is called Big Sky have you had a chance to check it out? I haven't seen that, but I have seen the new Star stuff. I really like that Disney Plus have branched out and got some different stuff. It feels weird that you're watching like Predator or True Crime on Disney Plus, but I have really liked their their Star stuff so far. Yeah, so it's all the adult content. So this one, well, adult oriented, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I haven't gone that far. Yeah, not that far. That's probably a step. <laughs> Disney Plus Plus. A step too far for Disney, I think. So this one's called Big Sky, and it's a drama series based on the book series called The Highway by C.J. Box. Uh, it originally aired in 
America on the ABC, but it's now on the Disney Plus Star offerings, and it follows two private detectives, Cassie Duell and Jenny Hoyt, as they investigate the disappearance of two sisters who are on a road trip through Montana, and the, the two detectives quickly find out that there's been a number of girls go missing in this area, and that there may be something a bit more sinister going on involving sort of human trafficking and the local highway patrol and it's like obviously a a fictional series based on a book series and um it's just a really intriguing crime drama mystery which moves at a pretty decent clip like you never sort of sit there thinking i'm not sure what's happening or i'm confused for too long it's it asks questions makes you think and then and sort of maybe an episode later lets you know what's going on and keeps the story moving it's never one where you're like i i'm lost yeah you need that with the mystery stuff hey yeah like i remember watching lost back in the day and (laughs) and getting lost by the end of the first season i was like i'm no more ahead of where i was at the end of this season at the start of this season like i'm yeah still confused that if anything i've got more questions yeah which i hate i hate when shows and movies do that uh so this one has uh, it's it's set for 12 episodes i think we're about eight into it now and lauren and i are really enjoying it it's become one of those ones that as soon as it drops every friday night so, all right big sky's on let's check this out Oh, nice. And then the other one that we've started watching on Disney Plus is the Mighty Ducks Game Changers. Oh, it's the series, isn't it? Yeah. Again, Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, they need to make it more obvious when something is a series or a movie. Because I remember when I first saw all the promotion for this show, I was like, oh yeah, sweet. It's just a modern movie of the Mighty Ducks. But no, this is a, a series that is set for 10 episodes releasing week to week on Disney Plus, but it acts as the direct follow-up to the, the movie from 1992. Okay, Yeah, because I went to watch it as well. I did the exact same thing that uh, I thought the new Mighty Ducks had come out and I went to watch it with some kids at work uh, towards the end of the term and did the exact same thing, clicked on it, it was like episode I was like, oh, so we actually ended up, instead of watching that, going back and watching the retro one, which most of them hadn't seen. Wow, that that's wild. <laughs> but I guess it makes sense. Oh, it happens. Heaps of them haven't seen Mighty Ducks. They haven't seen, like, Cool Runnings. They haven't seen the original Lion King. Like, it's, we're getting old, man. <laughs> that's got to be fun for you, though, when it gets to that time of, like, let's go back and watch a, a movie that I loved and these kids have never seen before. Yeah, it is, but it's a dangerous game because... Sometimes you'll put on things that you love and they'll just tell you it's old and crap. And yeah, the only one that's like guaranteed to get a positive reaction I found is the old Jumanji versus the new Jumanji. Everybody prefers the old Jumanji. Oh, 100%. The old one is way, way better. You can't beat Robin Williams. Cool Runnings didn't work? Yeah, not as much as Jumanji. Like Cool Runnings most of the time is pretty good. Okay. So yeah, for this series, they... um. They at least got the original writer of the movie, Stephen Brill, to come back and develop the series. So it does have, it does feel right. It doesn't, like, sometimes you see these sort of reboots 10, 20 years later that just don't feel the same. They're just cashing in on a name. Whereas this this properly feels like a Mighty Ducks show or movie. It feels like it's in that universe. And it follows Evan Morrow, played by Brady Noon, who's a 12-year-old. And he gets cut by the Mighty Ducks team because... In this timeline, they've become this powerhouse of junior hockey, <laughs> and uh, they are very selective on who gets to play for their team. And then when Evan gets cut, his mum, played by Lauren Graham from Gilmore Girls, oh, yep. she's basically like, this isn't fair, like, sport is supposed, especially junior sport for 12-year-olds, it's not meant to be this crazy competitive thing, like, we should just be having fun and getting to do what we enjoy, so... She encourages Evan to find six friends and create their own team. Uh, they go by the name the Do Nothings or Don't Bothers. Or don't Bothers is what it is because <laughs> that's what the, the coach says to him. He's, he's clearly not good enough, so don't bother even trying, basically, which not the greatest message to send as a sports coach. No. So, yeah, they set out and they, they gather up this team of misfit kids that half of them have never even played hockey before. Uh, some of them can't skate. They all have weird equipment one kid's just using a broomstick with a boomerang taped to the end of their hockey stick (laughs) Um, i feel like you're more likely to be able to find a used hockey stick where they are than a boomerang surely yep 
Yeah, the boomerang <laughs> seems a bit out of place considering it's like Minnesota or something. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a bit weird. But yeah, they they gather together this team and they find a a crappy old ice rink in the the back of town which just so happens to be run by Gordon Bombay, who is oh, convenient. Emilio Estevez. He reprises his role, which is awesome to see. But at this hockey rink, he has banned hockey because of everything that happened in the, the Mighty Arcs movies. But they, they find a way. They find some uh, surplus funds in the council budget, which they can give to Gordon to let him allow him to let them play hockey there and then as the, the episodes go we're only a couple of episodes into the series it looks like he's going to come back and coach them so i'm excited to see that happen see this team of misfits become much better at hockey than they are and then obviously the return of some of the the original cast is meant to be happening and there's been photos from the the production of them all coming together which will be awesome to see surely not goldberg yeah i think he might be might have been left out of this one i think he might be in jail <laughs> <laughs> he got done like breaking and entering and oh <laughs> i think yeah even if he is free and available disney might have went let's just let's just skip that one <laughs> goldberg <laughs> it's obviously a very cutesy kids show but it's got enough nostalgia there to make me like yeah okay i'll chuck this on every weekend like it's it's a nice easy watch good one to have on while while eating dinner or something. Yeah. Really good to have Emilio Estevez. Oh, yeah. So glad they got him to come back. If they had some random person playing Gordon Bombay, it would have been just weird. Yeah. I don't think it would have had the, the nostalgic hit if it didn't have him and those original cast members coming back eventually. Yeah. And Lauren Graham, the, the Gilmore Girls actress, she's perfect for that motherly role too, I reckon. Yeah, I think she's kind of pigeonholed herself into that role now. Like, Gilmore Girls and sure she's been on a few other shows where she's just like the mum she's just become that person like oh we need a nice friendly mum who do we get yeah lauren graham done yeah well if they broke don't fix it and now a quick word from our sponsors this week's episode of the commentary booth is brought to you by lf9 designs are you in need of a new logo event poster twitch overlays or emotes or even merchandise designs look no further than lf9 design for all of your graphic needs the team there can create anything you need to suit all of your styles. Contact Luke at lf9design at gmail.com or follow them over on Instagram at lf9design. Our second sponsor this week is CR Swim. Swim smart and swim fast. CR Swim provides top-level coaching for swimmers of all levels competing in all aspects of the sport. They focus on providing technique support, swimming efficiency coaching, and energy systems training to help you be the best swimmer you can possibly be. Check them out over on Facebook at CR Swim Squad or on Instagram at CR underscore swim. You are still on the, the doco train. What else have you been watching? Uh, on the sport side of things, I got really stuck into um, a series on Amazon Prime following AFL football called Making Their Mark. That seems out of your comfort zone. Yeah, well, that's it for me. Like, I'm not huge on AFL, but this really got me sucked into it and to the point where now I'm watching AFL because of how well it kind of pulled me in. So it it's a documentary series that's really similar to the idea of the All or Nothing series and, and anything that's kind of come out like that where they follow a team for a season. But I think what the, the Making Their Mark people have done really well is rather than just follow one team they follow players and like the executive staff from six different teams uh, so they follow particularly like Nick, Nick Natanui from the West Coast Eagles they follow the coach from the Gold Coast Suns they follow the captain for GWS uh, Stephen Canelio Eddie Betts from Carlton and they go through so basically they've got them the Adelaide Crows they've got in there they've got Richmond in there as well and because they get to follow the stories of so many different teams at the same time, they get a real mix of things happening and a lot of different angles that they can approach the show from rather than being really fixed to the one team and the one story, which I found really, really good because I've always found that when I watch the All or Nothing series or anything like that, that I get to a point where I get so invested in the teams and I get so invested in the players or the, the characters or whoever in there. But sport being sport, there's only ever one winner in a season. And you're really not likely to kind of just back that team from the start unless you, you kind of pull Manchester City or someone like that, which they've done occasionally. But 
the good thing for this one was there were so many players, so many executives and so many teams. Yeah, you sort of got that range of what was happening. There was teams doing really well and teams struggling, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, it, and it gets a, like a lot of different themes in there from the different teams, which I found they did quite well. So they followed them for 2020. So, I mean, it's for like everything that's going to be coming out for the next however long that follows anything in 2020, it's got a really long kind of COVID undertone to it and it obviously follows them going through the, the bubbles and stuff that they had to go into and players moving away from home and all sorts of things so they could play under the COVID restrictions. Yep. So, like, it's interesting, but... There's a big part of me that just can't wait till we get back to any type of reality documentary-ish TV that doesn't have to mention COVID. <laughs> but that's the reality of it, I guess, at the moment. So they obviously do a lot of stuff about COVID, but they also follow like uh, Eddie Betts is an Aboriginal football player from Carlton. And he's just an absolute legend. Like, <laughs> he'd be my new favourite Australian athlete. Like, he's getting older and he's like you follow him in terms of keeping his contract and stuff like that. But then it really kind of follows him through the real the heavy part of the black lives matter time through the year and he obviously through his career sadly enough has faced a lot of racism despite being like one of the best players the AFL has had for a long time and just the way he approaches it and his honesty with it and the way he wants other people to stand up and just everything about him like he's an awesome dad he's an awesome player he's an awesome leader he's an, like a proud aboriginal man that stands up to racism i just like i i would watch the whole thing again just to see Eddie Betts again. So he's definitely got a massive fan in me for everything he does. So it follows kind of him through that and um, a bit with Nick Natanui as well. But then you get to see sort of different perspectives of Stephen Cornelio is a new captain for the GWS Giants. So you get to see people trying to step up into leadership. Um, Damian Hardwick as like a the Richmond Football Club coach and the way he approaches things. It's really insightful in a lot of different ways, i found. And obviously with no spoilers because you know what happens with the season, but you get to follow Richmond as they go through and win their grand final as well, which is just a really awesome way to finish the series okay nice and yeah you mentioned you're now watching afl how are you how are you finding that i I finally kind of know a few players and appreciate like i've always appreciated afl for the sheer athleticism of the players i mean when you look at the size of the field and the stats that they do and how far they run and how hard they work those guys are absolute weapons yeah they are fit human beings crazy crazy and they work really hard but it almost gives you that little bit of like a you watch some of the teams so i watched the g GWS uh, Melbourne Demons game the other night and Canelio got injured and I was thinking oh man like I feel so bad for him he got injured last season he's had such a hard time as captain so it gives you that insight for someone that hasn't grown up watching AFL that you kind of know a bit behind the scenes and you connect more with it Uh, rather than having to have watched it your whole life and know the ins and outs from watching news about it or anything it just gives you that little bit of a connection to make the games more exciting. Okay nice yeah I've um, noticed Sportsbet keeps trying to get me to bet on AFL and I'm like I I don't follow it enough to do that. <laughs> yeah, well, well, after you watch this, so trust me, you'll love it. And if you don't love Eddie Betts at the end of this, I don't know what's wrong with you. I absolutely love the guy. Yeah, yeah, bloody sports bet. They send me a, a message like every week. Like, Here's the top bets for the AFL. I'm like, I make one bet once a month and it's not on AFL. Isn't that crazy the amount of like, hey, gamble on this. Here's a text message, gamble on this. Hey, have you thought about gambling today? Gamble responsibly. Yeah. <laughs> You just you just shouted at me to gamble ten times, and at the end said gamble responsibly, really quietly and quickly. <laughs> yeah, you you can't watch TV now and not see a gambling ad. It's weird. Oh, how is it with like Shaq at the moment? Is it like I don't, this? This is the irony of it. I remember the people they've got on there, but I can't remember the companies. So, like it's points bet or something. But I heard Shaquille O'Neal singing um, "Glory Glory" to that South Sydney on TV the other day, trying to get me to bet. Yeah, and then they had Mark Wahlberg on another one. Yeah, and then yeah, I. Ha- I'm the same with you. Like, I remember the people and, like, they had – who else have they had? Oh, they've had a bunch of American, like, basketballers and athletes and stuff like that, but I never remember what they're, what company they're promoting. I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's a weird ad, a weird yeah. tie-in celebrity. I don't know. I just – you get overseeing. You get, it must be – lucky for us that like, you can sit there and comfortably say, yep, I don't bet outside my means or – I only bet once in a blue moon. But man, I, I hate to think how much it must get some people. There used to be gambling addicts when people had to go like physically drive themselves down to the pub or to the TAB, bet there and drive home. There were still gambling addicts. Now you just sit on the phone and it's right there all the time. I can only imagine what it's creating. Oh, 100%. And then like, yeah, thankfully for me, like I'm just desensitized to those ads now, but there would be people that struggle incredibly. Yeah. And then like even the 
like some of the games we play, like FIFA with their ultimate team, like it's kind of already at that point trying to embed gambling into your head with the, the random packs and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I guess we're, we're kind of doing that with Pokemon cards back in our day. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Just didn't wait long enough for them to pay out. Yeah, just buy, buy a booster pack and hope you got something good. Yeah, well, look, I'm still looking for the dirt bag in primary school that stole my Charizard, Blastoise, and Venusaur. And now, if you think about it, they stole a lot of money off me. That, yeah, they they stole hundreds of dollars off you, if not thousands. Thousands now. <laughs> worst day of my childhood and worst day of my adulthood when I think about it. <laughs> when you, when you realise how much money they'd be worth now. Oh, yeah. You could have paid for the wedding. Could have paid for the wedding, that Charizard. Uh, and then there was one other one you were watching that I keep seeing pop up and I just haven't hit play. Is it worth my time? <laughs> well, I've been watching, uh, it's called Super Villain, The Making of Takashi 6 9 So... I don't know, have you, have you ever seen Takashi 6 9 before, the rapper with the rainbow hair and the rainbow teeth? No, I haven't. Like, I just seen the thing, I was like, that's an interesting looking dude, That, and I'm pretty sure there's a weird story behind this. But <laughs> Yeah, there is. There's a weird story behind him because he is a weird dude. Um, it's interesting. So it's another three-parter. Um, this one I found over on Stan. Yep. I think it might be like a America. I can't remember which company in America made it now, but they've got it on Stan. Um, but the way they approach it is, is quite cool. It's, uh, narrated by, oh, the guy from Breaking Bad that runs the chicken shop. I can't remember his name now. The evil oh yeah i know who you're talking about he's in the mandalorian too that guy yeah (laughs) it's narrated by him um and it kind of goes through the pre-fame so this guy his name originally was daniel hernandez and he was a guy that grew up in brooklyn um he's of mexican descent but was born in brooklyn um and it kind of follows him as he becomes famous via the internet so i think even if you don't really know much about him it's interesting just to watch someone who works out how to manipulate the internet uh, and the environment around him to his financial benefit so well and he really does make himself a super villain on purpose he didn't even originally really seem to like rap music that much he was more of like a, a metal emo sort of a, a fan and a screamo sort of a guy but he realized if he can combine those things with the rap music and start trying to make some music out of that, that it might be something different and unique. But basically he got famous out of trolling other people online. And it's a really interesting look at, like it or not, the people like, there's that like catch me outside girl and all those sorts of people that we sit here and we say how much we hate them and we don't like them, but we click on them. And out of the clicks, they get money and fame and they just attract your attention. He's really just made himself into this really big internet supervillain. So he kind of goes through and it follows, they they break it up into like traditional supervillains and the, the background story that damages them into wanting to become supervillains and how they never seem to die and all sorts of things um but in his case he kind of had some some damaged upbringing which is is sad but then that throws him into like that non-caring i'm going to do all this trolling becomes famous starts to realize he could become more famous if he made himself unmissable so he goes rainbow hair rainbow teeth face tattoos gets some songs out there and and some really crazy footage but then starts to get himself into the gang culture of brooklyn and he he kind of gets himself into called the nine tray bloods so he starts telling everyone he's a blood gangster and all this stuff when really he never grew up like that he pretended he did but then these gangsters basically realize that if we take this guy under our wing we can make a lot of money out of him so then he starts having all of his rap videos and things with just all these blood gangsters in the background who love being famous who love getting all the money and all the attention but it kind of follows him as he takes himself too deep he manipulates a lot of situations and gets a lot of fame out of it has a lot of beef with different rappers gets super famous gets incredibly rich incredibly fast but then he also gets brought down in an fbi like rico case where they start to bring all the gangsters down because he's standing there posing with gangsters with all this cash with all these uh, assault rifles and things and just not thinking about it and just thinking he was untouchable. Eventually he gets himself to a point where he is arrested and taken into custody with a lot of these guys and the thing that he is known for now is that he basically ratted on them to get out of prison, which... Not the smartest idea. In a gangster world, I mean, yeah, if you're hanging around with like nine tray bloods and people that really do kill people, like they don't just rap about it and they don't just wave guns around for the sake of it, not the people I would flip on. Like, not that anyone should ever flip in those scenarios, but, I mean, like, that's crazy to think he did that. So, like, if he steps foot back in uh, New York now, I think he's in deep, deep trouble. But 
he just doesn't care. Like he, he just goes through this whole life of manipulating situations, manipulating the internet, and he gets what he wants out of it. And everybody around him, whether by intention or whether by accident or whether by not being able to look away from the rainbow colored car crash, give him all the money and attention he's after. So it's, yeah, it's a really interesting look into that. I don't think he'll be the last type of internet troll that gets that sort of fame. It's just crazy to watch it happen. I might have to check it out. It sounds actually a lot more interesting than I expected it to be yeah and they don't just pump him up which is what i liked about it they they really call him out which i thought was good because it sounds like they've got they've got interviews from him particularly for this show because he's in protected custody now um and he's kind of in hiding obviously so they've somehow got those interviews from him but they still will basically call him out and they there's times where they call him like a a truly horrible human being or a whatever else they do say oh, he's a social media mastermind this and that but there's times where they call him out for just exactly what he is which is a crazy internet troll interesting so yeah it's i looked it up it's directed by Giancarlo esposito okay and yeah that's the the uh the chicken guy from breaking bad and that's the guy yeah i mean he's really good narrating it he's perfect he has a very unique voice he does and the way that he approaches it is really interesting they kind of look at it like what different elements need to be made up for a supervillain to exist and what's the common storyline in supervillains and how does he fit in but yeah interesting not just with him as a supervillain but the idea of supervillains that the internet creates yeah it makes me sort of think of um i keep seeing the ads on tv for Dancing to the Stars that features Chappelle Corby this season. Oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> it's like, you're not a celebrity. Yeah, but you know what? People talk about it. You and I are talking about it right now because of Chappelle Corby, and they know that. Yeah. So that's exactly what he was doing. Okay. Um, I might check it out this weekend then. You've got me. Probably better to watch that than to watch Chappelle Corby dance. Oh, I'm definitely not watching Chappelle Corby dance. <laughs> I just keep watching the ads that pop up. I'm like, no, I'm not a celebrity. <laughs> Get off dancing with the stars you know who she is (laughs) and then yeah on a much different track uh we started re-watching or i'm re-watching lauren's watching it for the very first time true blood thanks to leah's encouragement of (laughs) when she started talking about vampire diaries last time she was on or maybe the time before she's been watching it for months it feels like i was like okay i kind of want to watch something vampire related and then we were flicking through binge and saw (sighs) the vampire diaries and lauren said she'd never seen it so like Okay, we'll rewatch this because I think I had only I've only watched two seasons, so we've watched the first two seasons so far, and it's a. Have you watched True Blood before? I've not watched anything vampire since Twilight. To be honest with you, <laughs> that was enough vampires for me. Okay, yep. So this is it has very Twilight vibes, but less sort of teen drama, more adult drama. Yeah. So this one originally debuted in 2008 there's seven seasons in total and it's based on a book series by charlene harris called the southern vampire mysteries and it revolves around suki stackhouse who's played by anna paquin she is a telepathic waitress and the 173 year old vampire bill compton played by stephen moyer as these two characters sort of fall in love and become connected and as the series goes on we find out that there's a bunch of different vampires there's shapeshifters there's all sorts of supernatural elements that just people don't realize the only in this world the only sort of supernatural beings that people understand to exist are vampires because there's a company that has developed synthetic blood known as true blood minus the e and that has allowed sort of vampires to come out as the show says come out of the coffin and let their presence be known to mankind so then from there the show is all about the the sort of struggle for equal rights for vampires in human society the different take on things yeah so it echoes all the sort of racial and lgbt rights tensions that we sort of see in the real world now but just with vampires and instead so far like the first two seasons are really good although it does feel a little bit dated some of the some of the cgi is very obvious um <laughs> like the lgbt mentions throughout it are a little bit like ooh, that probably wouldn't fly today but isn't that crazy how that happens with shows and you just at the time you don't think anything of it but you look back and you go oh yeah and it's like 2008 doesn't feel like yeah, it's 12 years ago, but it doesn't feel that long ago, and it feels like we've come a long way since then. Oh, I watched, I went further, I watched um, Ace Ventura. Oh boy, yeah, oh boy. Oh man, I'll tell you what, <laughs> yeah, I don't think you could put that on again in 2021. Oh yeah, I'm sure they play it on TV, but I don't think they could 
remake that these days. Oh, just, yeah, some of the lines and some of the things that are said, you think, oh, yeah, no, nah, very, very sexist and very tacky. Yeah, so this this show has some of those elements, but apart from that, like, it's a really enjoyable show. Obviously, very sort of cheesy rom-com elements, but then it's obviously with vampires, there's some very gruesome and violent elements as well. Uh, and, yeah, Anna Paquin, pretty awesome a- actress. Uh, there's a couple of... Australians on there. Ryan Quantin plays Sookie Stackhouse's brother Jason. He's just a funny dude. Alexander Skarsgård is another vampire on there. So there's some really recognizable actors in sort of early mainstream TV roles in this show, it's, which is always fun to see when you go back and watch something 10 plus years old. Be like, oh, that's where that person started. Yeah. So what would be your pick of the week i honestly really really enjoyed all three things i think uh, if you've never really heard anything or seen anything about luna park before though i I couldn't go past uh exposed the fire on the ghost train okay yeah that one's that one's at the top of my list now that yeah really interesting i read the article that we got for work and then when you said you'd been watching i was like okay this must be pretty good (laughs) yeah and really easy to access to i mean abc i have you completely free easy to watch and I mean, next time you go to Luna Park or go near Sydney Harbour, you won't look at Luna Park the same. Okay, perfect. Uh, for me, it's Big Sky. Like, like I said, it's become a must watch every Friday for us and it moves moves quick enough where you're not going to be lost. It, and there's only 12 episodes which are coming very close to the end. So within like three or four weeks from this episode coming out, you'll have the full season to be able to go and binge watch in one go. Um, and while I have you, you mentioned that you had binge through Telstra. Have you checked um the justice league out on there i haven't no if you're gonna do it make sure you start it early in the day especially you with your your son floor naps <laughs> you might need a few sittings to watch the four hour movie four hours yep no movie needs to go for four hours this one did <laughs> okay is it four hours that it's going to make me want to have a nap or is it four hours that i'll be in for it's four hours that i think you'll be in for but the sun will hit you and you'll fall asleep. Yeah, that's a fair point. Classic, buddy. <laughs> but yeah, because DC didn't have all the, like with Marvel, they had all the individual movies first to let you know who these characters were. DC kind of dropped that ball with the Justice League, so they kind of had to put a bunch of backstory in to this movie to make it make sense. And this new Zack Snyder cut actually fixes a lot of those issues. But yeah, four hours. So strap in if you're going to check that one out. Yeah, all right. Stay out of the sunshine. Stay out of your... Your couch in the sun. As long as you're <laughs> on the couch in the shade, you might stay awake. Never. Okay, thank you for listening to the commentary booth. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media at Jamie Ups Media and at Pario Magazine. You can follow Buddy on Instagram at a.b underscore c s double e. And Buddy will be back next time as a married man. Woohoo! Thanks for having me. The commentary booth is a fan funded production of Jamie Ups Media. You can support the podcast alongside our new magazine, Pario Magazine, on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash media. The following people have supported at the publisher level or higher, and you cannot fathom how incredibly appreciative we are for their support. Brian and June Hart, Courtney Paulson, Tracy Epps.